before we go on to our next example of noise, uh, what I'd like to do is to backtrack a little bit and put some of the things we've been discussing regarding uh, the Langevin equation, power spectra, and so on in perspective, and uh, make contact with the more general formalism <laughs> called that of linear response theory. This is so that it gives you a complete picture of what exactly the generalized susceptibility is, what the power spectrum is and how it is related and so on. And again, the most convenient or simplest model in which to do this is the example we have been looking at throughout, namely uh, the velocity, one component of the velocity of a fluid particle in a fluid in equilibrium at temperature T. So, we wrote the Langevin model for it. We extracted a lot of information up from about it, about the output process. We proved that you had the onstein uhlenbeck process come out naturally and so on. But let us uh, put this in a slightly more general footing and see what happens. Um, just to refresh your memory, the Langevin equation that we wrote down was m v dot plus uh, m gamma v was equal to the force on the right hand side. Now, this force we took to be a random fluctuating force in the absence of any external force, but let us put an external force on the system and see what happens, right. So, there was this uh, square root of gamma times eta of t, this was the uh, fluctuating random force here, plus uh, suppose you apply some external force as a function of t, this is what you would get. And similarly, exactly similarly, this we looked at the resistance model in LR circuit for example, which had an equation like uh, L i dot plus R i was again equal to a fluctuating voltage, V uh, let us call it random, V random of T plus maybe some applied voltage, V applied of T in this fashion. And there was a correspondence between these two things which came out as we went along. Uh, there was a fluctuation dissipation theorem which related the strength of this noise to the dissipation here. That is called the second fluctuation dissipation theorem and we will we'll talk about this a little more today. Uh, this turned out to be the square root of 2 m gamma k Boltzmann t times eta of t plus f external of t. Okay. And now, if you took averages, if you took statistical averages, then this becomes m and then because the average value of eta is 0 out here, it turns out that m times uh, v average dot etcetera. Now, let us do this directly in terms of uh, Fourier, Fourier components. So, I have in mind formally writing uh, a function of time as integral minus infinity to infinity d omega e to the minus i omega t times f tilde of omega and its inverse transform. Okay. And this would immediately lead us to m times gamma minus i omega v tilde of omega average, average is equal to this term vanishes upon averaging equal to whatever was the Fourier component there. So, f external of omega in this fashion. So, this says that the response that you have for each Fourier component of the velocity, this quantity is equal to 1 over m times gamma minus i omega times f external or applied of omega here. The corresponding story here once again was that uh, the current i tilde of omega is equal to 1 over this produced a minus i omega. So, it is r minus i omega l times v applied of omega. And of course, this is what you call the complex admittance of the circuit. So, this is some y of omega v applied to the omega. 
So, this quantity by definition is the complex admittance of this circuit. its reciprocal is a complex impedance of course. Exactly similarly this quantity here is called the dynamic mobility because what it does is to measure what the average velocity is the component velocity component at the frequency omega is per unit applied amplitude at the frequency omega. So, this is uh, by definition equal to some mu of omega times f external field of omega and this quantity is called the dynamic mobility. Okay. It is a complex number in general, it is a complex function here. So, this follows very straightforwardly from here, but what is interesting is that we found a relation between the power spectrum of the input and the power spectrum of the output we discovered that the modulus squared of this mu of omega actually gave us the power spectrum in the absence of the external force. Okay. So, we actually discovered that in the absence of the external force, in the absence of f external of t, when you only have the random force, the internal random force and it is fluctuating we discovered that the average value of the velocity was actually 0 because the fluctuating force had a 0 average unlike this case where you actually have a non-zero average. But it turned out that you could find what the velocity correlation was and we discovered that this quantity s uh, by the way we call this zeta of t right we call this combination zeta of t. So, that the the correlation function of uh, zeta of t had already a gamma times the delta function here. So, this quantity s zeta the noise of omega this thing here was related to the input out there and we found that uh, in the other way about we found that s the velocity omega was equal to mod mu of omega squared times uh, s zeta of omega for the power spectra. And what is this fellow equal to? This guy was equal to the Fourier transform. So, because we use the symmetry property etcetera, but in the absence of that 1 over 2 pi minus infinity to infinity d to d t e to the i omega t v of 0 v of t in the absence of the external force in equilibrium. So, this is a non-trivial relationship because after all what is the mobility measuring? It is measuring the response the average response to unit applied force at some given frequency. On the other hand we also discover that the power spectrum of the output variable the velocity response variable due to thermal fluctuations is related to the power spectrum of the noise which is the driving force here through precisely the same mu of omega mod squared. Okay. So, this means there is a connection deep connection between response to an applied perturbation and spontaneous fluctuations in the absence of this perturbation. Okay. This is a deep relationship it is the gist of it is at the bottom of linear response theory here. This is crucial for stability because we already saw in a very soon this example itself we saw that if I did not have this term and I assume this to be delta correlated then it turned out that this quantity here the mean square value of this v in equilibrium increased with time linearly which is unphysical. So, you needed the dissipation and at that point I said well this is sort of telling you that you cannot have uncontrolled fluctuations the more the system is thrown out of equilibrium the more uh, it is brought back by the dissipation present in the system here right. So, stability is maintained and the consequence of that is that the power spectra are connected, but this is a deep relationship because it is telling you that the average response in the presence of an external force is somehow related to the autocorrelation in the absence of this force. Okay. So, this is not linear in B this is quadratic in B. On the other hand the average is linear. 
So, it is a marvelous relationship, it is a consistency condition which is essential for stability and we found that explicitly in this problem. Right? Now, the same thing is true here too. So, there is a relation which will tell you the relationship between the fluctuations here and the fluctuations here. We saw what it was. It is precisely this thing here with this translation of language m to l and m gamma is r. So, it is uh, gamma is replaced by the characteristic uh, time scale r over l inverse time scale. So, with this uh, translation from one to the other, these two models are essentially the same. Okay. So, we could write down similar things in that case too. So, there is a deep relationship between the fluctuations in the absence of the force and the average response in the presence of the force to first order in this external force. Okay which is why I keep saying linear response. In fact, we can go a step further. We can see exactly what it is in this model. Uh, it is not hard to see that if you took mu of omega, but we already found out what this S v of omega is, right? S v of omega was equal to this quantity here and by symmetry this was it was 1 over pi and then there was a k t. So, it is k b t over m pi and then you had uh, 0 to infinity e to the minus gamma t. So, there was a gamma k t over 1 over gamma squared plus omega squared on this side and now if you ask what is the real part of mu of omega. So, mu of omega was equal to 1 over m gamma minus i omega. By the way, the power spectrum here it is clear it is real because the way we have defined it sorry we should say this properly. We started by saying that this power spectrum was the Fourier transform 1 over 2 pi capital T 0 to capital T e to the i omega t times this uh, signal mod squared. So, it is a real number right. So, it is fair to compare the real part of this mu of omega that gives you 1 over m gamma squared plus omega squared with a gamma on top. Okay. So, what does that tell you? Uh, this is also equal to, uh, so this is equal to, so gamma over m can cancel. So, k t over pi real part of mu of omega. Now, mu of omega is the dynamic susceptibility. It tells you something about the response of the system to an external force, the average response to an external force. And the real part of that susceptibility is directly equal to the power spectrum of the spontaneous fluctuations in the absence of this external force. So, there is one more way of writing this response relaxation relationship. Okay. This side is a response and this side gives you the way the velocity correlations die out. So, it is a relaxation and this thing is called a fluctuation dissipation theorem. It is actually called the first fluctuation dissipation theorem because there is a second theorem also which was this variable, the driving variable, this noise in the system, is that related to the dissipation in the system? Yes. In fact, it is this. The strength of this force here is directly related to this fellow here and that is very often called the second fluctuation dissipation theorem. Okay. Let us write that down because uh, I want to generalize that. So, let us write that down. So, it I will write this down in the following way. Zeta of uh, 0, zeta of t in equilibrium. Let me put that just to show that there is no external force. Not that this is going to change because of that, but let us for completeness put it here. This guy here equal to 2 m gamma k Boltzmann t times a delta of t. 
So, if you integrate this from 0 from minus infinity to infinity d t this guy here you end up with a 1 and if I write this as 1 over 2 k Boltzmann t that gives you m gamma on that side and we know this is an even function of t. So, I can write this as twice 0 to infinity of this is this gamma. and it is sometimes called the second fluctuation dissipation theorem because it tells you that the dissipation in the system is related to the spontaneous fluctuations in the system, the noise in the system. This integral of this autocorrelation is that guy there okay. and there you have a similar relationship which again connects relaxation and response. Okay. So, this term fluctuation dissipation theorem is sort of used interchangeably and we know that the two power spectra are connected through this relationship here. Okay. Now, this quantity here is what would be called in engineering the transfer function. I do not know what symbol you use for the transfer function A h of omega. it is the mod squared of this fellow 1 over r over r squared plus omega squared l squared is the transfer function for an LR circuit right. Now, let us try to put this in a more general framework where this comes from what all this where all this comes from and there is a small thing you have to notice which is slightly different and uh, that is the following. Is it possible for me to write a formula for this mu of omega directly in terms of uh, this velocity autocorrelation function. This is how we derive that. The answer is yes, uh, because if you took this, uh, we'll we'll come to this formula. I want to connect this susceptibility, this dynamic susceptibility mobility <coughs> mu of omega, to directly to some integral over the fluctuation over the autocorrelation of the velocity. Okay, it's already implicit here in this, but we'll make it a, make this relation look like that. I want to make it look like that. We will see how to do this. Okay. So, let us go back, step back, and try to cast this in a slightly more general language and see what all these correlations mean and where they come from. Okay. First, a few words about linear response. Okay. Suppose you have some force on a system, some perturbation, and the system you measure some observable, system responds through some observable which you measure and you want to ask what is this response like to likely to be in the most general case where you assume just the following general principles. First you assume that the response is linear, it is linear in the applied perturbation. So, it is got to be a small force in some specific sense. The second thing you assume is that it should be causal that is the effect should not take place before the cause okay. and the third thing is that it should be retarded namely the statistical properties of this system we will always assume it to be in thermal equilibrium do not change everything is stationary and there is no aging or anything like that going on right. Then if I apply in general terms if I apply some kind of force f of t to a system and I ask how does it respond and I measure some observable for want of a better word let us call that observable some x of t. You measure this quantity. This has got to be a superposition over all histories dt prime of this force times some response function in between, some phi which is a function of t minus t prime. This is the most general linear functional that you can write down. It is a sum over all histories of the applied force up to this time t. So, there is no anticipatory response it is linear in this f and it is retarded it is a function only of the elapsed time difference between the two okay. Every other uh, application of any external force is a special case of this okay. Now, once you have this you could ask general causal 
retarded linear response. Now, of course, if it is a vector or a tensor and this thing is a matrix, it does not matter, we can put in all those indices later, but this is the simplest instance. Now, if I formally make a Fourier transform on both sides, I expand these things in Fourier transforms, then it is a matter of very simple algebra to show that this quantity x tilde of omega is related to the Fourier transform of this guy through a function. So, this is f tilde of omega. Mm -hmm. multiplied in general by a function some chi of omega and this thing is called the generalized susceptibility. So, it tells you it is exactly the analog of the complex admittance or the dynamic mobility etcetera. It tells you per unit applied force amplitude at a given frequency what is the response equal to. Okay. At this stage there is no statistical mechanics or anything like that put in at all. It is a general statement of causal linear response. Okay. This quantity here is called a response function. And we cannot say anything more about this without knowing more about the system itself we need to put in more specific things ok. So, now the question is can I write an expression for this chi of omega using just this fact here putting in the Fourier transform and the answer is yes it is immediate all you have to do is to put in the Fourier transform and change man, manipulate a bit and this will imply with chi of omega equal to an integral from 0 to infinity d t e to the i omega t phi of t. Okay. First of all note that this function phi of t as it stands is only defined for positive values of the argument because you cut it off out here. Okay. Sometimes you would uh, write a green function you would say that you know so just, just for analogy so that you can make connection to that. Sometimes you have a problem in which you have some differential operator d x and d t with respect to t say acting on a function x of t equal to a given function f of t. Sometimes you are given that kind of state right and then you are asked to solve for this x of t for a given f of t right with some initial conditions and so on and so forth. So, what is the formal solution to this? This is x of t equal to d t inverse on f of t. This is some differential operator involving derivatives with respect to time, functions of time and so on and so forth. We do not care what kind of operator it is hmm? and you have to find its inverse. Okay. Now, it is reasonable that the inverse of a differential operator is some kind of integral operator. So, in general the solution would look like this is equal to integral d t prime g of t and t prime f of t prime. This guy is just a representation of the inverse operator in explicit form. So, it is some integral operator with a kernel of this kind. Okay. Now, if this operator is time translation invariant and so on and so forth under suitable assumptions this will turn out to be a function of t minus t prime in this fashion. The integral runs from minus infinity to infinity and if it is causal it will say that this cuts off for negative values of the argument which would be equivalent to saying that this is of the form some uh, phi of t minus t prime times the step function t minus t prime so that the integral gets cut off. Okay. So, this is the connection between the causal green function and the response function. I put this t here explicitly so I did not write g otherwise I would have written g okay. just to make connection with the normal right way of writing the green function. Okay. So, we are not going to use this, but what we have here is a statement uh, 
that you take this response function which to start with is defined for positive values non negative values of its argument integrated with this weight factor e to the i omega t 0 to infinity. It is not a Laplace transform and it is not a Fourier transform either because it is one sided it is 0 to infinity. Now, this infinity comes from here when you do this manipulation, but this 0 comes from here from this thing here from causality. So, that is why it is cut off this guy here is directly connected with this limit here okay. and this is important to note. Hmm. Now, you might say maybe this integral does not converge you have to worry about convergence and so on of such integrals, but the fact is that if it converges without this factor it would certainly converge with it because that is an oscillatory factor and there are places where it becomes negative and so on. At a formal level if this is posed to you as an initial value problem from t equal to 0 upwards etcetera then what you do is to take Laplace transforms right, rather than Fourier transforms but what you have here is this guy here out here. So, you could formally say that this generalized susceptibility is the Laplace transform of the response function which after all is defined for its argument from t equal to 0 upwards analytically continued to s equal to minus i omega. So, you could say that this is also equal to the Laplace transform of phi of t evaluated at s equal to minus i omega. Okay. So, that technical difficulties with convergence and so on can be overcome. Okay. So, this is just to make contact with cases where you start applying the force from t equal to 0 onwards etcetera then you get exactly the same answer if you took the Laplace transform and replace the s with minus i omega you analytically continue to that point. Okay, so so much for uh, the general case. This is what it is. We still don't know anything about this phi of t. Okay. On the other hand, in the kind of problem we've been looking at, we need to motivate the fact that this phi of t has a very special form. It turns out to be an autocorrelation function in the absence of the external force. And the question is, where does that come from? Right here, there's no such uh, no mention of any extra anything at all. You're saying you're applying a force f, and you're saying there's a response here. Right? So, what happens in that case is the following and that is where the formalism of linear response theory comes in, but let me say it in simpler terms. Okay. What really happens is that uh, you start by saying here is a system in thermal equilibrium at some temperature t and there is an equilibrium density matrix okay, which is e to the minus beta times the Hamiltonian of the system. So, you have a system with Hamiltonian H naught and it is in thermal equilibrium. So, the density matrix in thermal equilibrium rho equilibrium equal to e to the minus beta H naught okay. and then you can find the average value of any given quantity by the prescription of equilibrium statistical mechanics. Okay. So, if you have some observable B and this guy is some observable the average value of B is trace rho times b divided by trace rho. Okay. We will normalize things so that trace rho is also e always equal to 1. Okay. We can always do that so the denominator goes away otherwise you have to keep this thing. Okay. So, this fellow here is equal to trace e to the minus beta h naught times b and we can compute its variance and so on and so forth. Okay. Now, I perturb the system by applying an external force on it of some kind. This force always couples to some physical observable of the system and let us without loss of generality say that it couples to some observable A so that this Hamiltonian H naught goes to H equal to H naught minus this observable A times some coupling strength let me call it f of t. Okay. I have in mind the problem of the particle in which I am going to apply an external force. 
and then if it is a constant force for example, then the potential energy corresponding to this constant force you, you need the force is minus dv over dx. So, I set v equal to minus x times f of t and if f is a constant for instance, you would get minus d over dx minus x f is in fact f. So, that is the reason for the minus sign it is purely a matter of convention it is just to tell you that in the case when f turns out to be a constant force and I put a equal to x I would in fact get the derivative of that potential is equal to f the force minus the derivative equal to the force. Okay. So, the question is what happens to the expectation value of b to first order in this force f okay. and that is going to be of the form b goes from here b this is in equilibrium goes to b equal to b equilibrium plus a delta b that is the effect of this external force this is first order in this small quantity f okay. and we need to compute this average. Okay. Now, the way to do that is straightforward because when you have any classical variable and we are doing everything in the classical Hamiltonian context for any observable whatsoever you can write d b over d p if this does not explicitly involve time if this quantity does not explicitly in observable does not explicitly involve time, but involves only the canonical coordinates say since we are doing the Hamiltonian framework this is given by the analog of the Heisenberg equation of motion in classical mechanics right and what is that equal to the Poisson bracket of b with h right which is equal to the Poisson bracket of b with h naught minus f of t times the Poisson bracket of b with a. And we have to solve this equation this is the differential equation that you have to solve and then compute averages and so on and so forth. So, I am not going to do that except to write the answer down and it turns out that if you do this then delta b turns out to be equal to ok first a word on how this is done I should uh, explain how this is done. Uh, well, the response function in this case phi and now I need to remember that A is the perturbation and B is the observable. So, let us call this phi A B of T minus T prime hmm, turns out to be in this case the expectation value of the Poisson bracket of uh, a of t prime with b of t in equilibrium. Okay. That means in the absence of this uh, perturbation. So, what does that mean? That means this quantity, this average, says take trace of this quantity inside with respect to the density matrix e to the minus beta h naught ok. That is the meaning of this average here ok. And the reason is simple because what you have to do is to pretend this is kept to first order. So, in some sense to solve such an equation you would have to exponentiate whatever is on the right hand side and keep this to first order that means it comes down in this thing. On the other hand, this fellow remains to all orders up there. Okay. So, at the end of a little bit of manipulation, this is the answer that you get here, but it still has not put it in the form of a correlation function. Okay. Now, that will depend on the following very simple observation this is equal to a trace e to the minus beta h naught Poisson bracket of A of t prime b of t and now exploit the fact 
that there is cyclic invariance of the trace okay. and then it is not hard to show by the way you can tell what is b of t at any time t you can write it in terms of b of 0 by the analog of whatever you did in quantum mechanics when you went from the Schrodinger to the Heisenberg picture with e to the h naughts and so on on the left. So, a little bit of manipulation gets you to the following. So, it takes you to this thing here becomes trace Poisson bracket of e to the minus beta h naught with a of 0 b of t minus t prime. This becomes equal to that by the cyclic invariance of the trace. Okay. So, notice first that you have got this function of t minus t prime emerging that comes about by putting the time dependences here in terms of a of 0, b of 0, etcetera and using the cyclic problem invariance of the trace. Okay. The next step is to compute this quantity, uh, but look at what this is. This is equal to if you had q's and p's as your degrees of freedom for example, it would be delta e to the minus beta h naught over delta q delta a of 0 by delta p minus delta e to the minus beta h naught delta p delta a of 0 over delta q summed over degrees of freedom and so on. So, I am assuming there are n degrees of freedom and I put a q i p i etcetera etcetera. Okay. But if I differentiate this it is equal to delta h naught over delta q with a minus beta e to the minus beta h naught outside. So, you get a minus beta e to the minus beta h naught and then this is replaced by delta h naught. But this is equal to minus beta times e to the minus beta h naught. Oh, by the way, after you do this, you got to take a trace, you got to multiply by this and do a trace. So, right now, all we are doing is to simplify this fellow all the way down uh, times Poisson bracket of h naught with a of 0. But that is equal to beta times e to the minus beta h naught Poisson bracket of a of 0 with h naught. But we now take recourse to this. Any operator, its time derivative is the Poisson bracket of the operator with the Hamiltonian. In the absence of the external force, it is the free Hamiltonian and the operators assumed to be have no explicit time dependence that is what we put into f of t. Okay. So, this guy is therefore equal to beta e to the minus beta h naught times a dot of 0 because that is the definition of d a over d t and then you set t equal to 0 after you differentiate. So, this becomes equal to trace beta times trace e to the minus beta h naught a dot of 0 b of t minus t prime trace of this whole guy which is nothing but 1 over k t times the average of a of 0 b of t minus t prime a dot of 0 with this in equilibrium. So, that is how the correlation appears, the, the auto correlation appears. But notice the perturbation is in A, the operator or dynamical variable that appears is in A, but what is appearing here is A dot. Okay. So, we have a formula that tells us this response function classically, this fellow here is 1 over k Boltzmann t times the equilibrium autocorrelation 
that is the response function. So, it immediately gives us a formula for what the generalized susceptibility is because the susceptibility therefore, chi a b of omega must be 1 over k Boltzmann t an integral from 0 to infinity d t e to the i omega t a dot of 0 b of t in equilibrium. So, it follows at once in general that this is what the susceptibility is. What we need to do is to see whether our Langevin model for which we had an explicit stochastic differential equation for v of t will tally with this if we write it in the proper language. Now, what is it we are doing when we are measuring the mobility? You are measuring the velocity response, average velocity response. So, what is mu of omega equal to? It is a generalized susceptibility. But what is A in that case and what is B in that case? Well, A has to so B is clearly the velocity, we are measuring the average velocity, hmm? that is what the measurement of the mobility implies. And what is A equal to? You are applying a mechanical force, right. So, A is x, the position, right. So, by definition, this guy equal to chi x v of omega position velocity cross whatever is susceptibility. Okay. But that your advice here must be equal to 1 over k Boltzmann t times an integral from 0 to infinity d t e to the i omega t and then a dot of 0, but a is x. So, a dot is v, right. So, this is what brings in the v here expectation v of 0, v of t in equilibrium. Okay. Independent of the Langevin model, we did not do anything, we did not bring in any stochastic differential equation at all. That is the general formula for the dynamic mobility in this one component <coughs> system. Hmm? But the Langevin model gives you a formula for this autocorrelation because you now have a detailed stochastic differential equation which is giving something about some information about the dissipation in the system etcetera and it is a model, it is still a model right. And in that model, in the Langevin model, This is 1 over k Boltzmann t integral 0 to infinity d t e to the i omega t e to the minus gamma k Boltzmann t over m e to the minus gamma t. In that model, this is what we got, okay. And now it is a simple step to see the k t cancels and it gives 1 over m gamma minus i omega. Which is what we know already. So, this is derived from the Langevin model directly. We did not play around with the stochastic differential equation. In particular, we did not put in an ex external force, a random force. We did not talk about its correlations. We did not do anything like that. We just took linear response theory directly and use this formula and you get exactly the same answer. Okay. So, this is consistent, the Langevin model is consistent with linear response theory. But response theory gives you a general sort of formula. In fact, it will tell you what to do in the quantum case. When these are, when this is the Heisenberg equation of motion, this is I h d b over d t is a commutator here. And when the Poisson brackets were replaced with commutators and things do not commute with each other and so on, then you get a slightly more general formula here. You actually get a not a Poisson bracket of A with B, but a commutator of unequal time commutator A at time t, B at time t prime, uh, the other way about A at time t prime, B at time t, 
and then from that you play around and you do not quite get this. You get a more complicated formula for the uh, generalized susceptibility, but once again it will involve equilibrium correlations. Okay. So, notice that something fairly non trivial has been done. We started with the response function which involved an unequal time Poisson bracket or in the quantum language a commutator and you are able to evaluate it and finally, write it in a simplified form in terms of an autocorrelation of some kind. Okay. So, there is a general uh, relationship uh, between uh, the uh, power spectrum of the spontaneous fluctuations in the output variable for instance and the corresponding dynamic susceptibility average response here. Now, what about the other relation? What about the second fluctuation dissipation theorem? That depended directly on writing a stochastic differential equation, putting in an external force of some kind etcetera, et putting in explicitly a random noise, making some assumptions about this noise etcetera. But I said that we should like to write uh, the power spectrum of that f force also in this form. So, by the way we can we can uh, write down in this formula here, notice how T appears quite naturally it appears here. Incidentally, what was the diffusion coefficient equal to in this problem? it was just this integral here as it stood right. So, the diffusion coefficient is related to the susceptibility the mobility at 0 frequency and what was the relation? And m gamma was the mobility at 0 frequency right. So, we could write uh, I am not happy with that relation sorry 1 over m gamma. So, that is a side outcome of the fact that at 0 frequency the mobility essentially measures the diffusion coefficient. Okay. Now, one could go a step further and ask uh, we after all had a very simple model the Langevin model is there a more general way of writing this uh, formula down this this response down paying attention to the fact that this thing susceptibility turns out to be too trivial. It just got oh by the way a, a couple of comments about the susceptibility let me make those two as well here say that properly. So, look at the generalized mobility chi of omega is 1 over k Boltzmann t integral 0 to infinity d t e to the i omega t phi a b of t ok. Now, we will assume that a and b are real observables or Hermitian op operators in the quantum case, then it immediately follows from this that for real frequencies chi of minus omega equal to chi star of omega. So, there is a symmetry property. Okay. We saw a similar symmetry property for the uh, power spectrum. We saw that this uh, function for a single component object it had to be uh, Positive, uh, had to be a symmetric function okay, in omega. Now, everything depends on what the time reversal property of this quantity is this thing here and in general we cannot make any statement at all because A and B need not have definite time reversal properties right. On the other hand in the simple example we looked at this guy this fellow was e to the minus gamma modulus t. So, it was a symmetric function. Okay we can ask what is the general statement what can we say in general. Well, what we have to note is that this guy here if you write this as 1 over k Boltzmann t uh, no sorry what did we do. What did I write here? Mm. 
sorry I should not write it like this, write this as explicitly a dot of 0 b of t, sorry. Yeah. That times 1 over k t is equal to the response function phi a b. Now, if you look at what this phi a b is, it is equal to 1 over k Boltzmann t times a dot of 0 b of t and you ask this will imply that phi a b of minus t, this is phi a b of t, what will this be? Well, it depends on the time reversal properties of these operators or observables, okay. There is an a dot of 0. So, if a for example is a velocity, it will change sign under time reversal. If it is a position, it does not change sign and so on. So, it has got some time reversal property. Let us call that epsilon a which is plus 1 if a is does not change sign under time reversal and minus 1 if it changes sign. And then there is an epsilon b which is also sitting here and there is an a dot. So, there is a d over dt sitting there and that is going to change a sign. So, minus and then phi a b. So, in the most general case you tell me what is a what is b and I tell you what this phi will do. Okay. And in general it need not have a time parity, it need not have a specific epsilon a, it could be mixed. Okay. But in the cases where it has a definite symmetry one way or the other even or odd, you can write down what it is. So, this whole number is either plus 1 or minus 1. So, we can therefore have assign a definite uh, even or odd nature as a function of time to this response function, not necessary in general. <coughs> so, the question is what can we conclude from this formula here? Well, the first thing we see is that <coughs> if this integral exists mm, at 0 frequency, it certainly exists for complex frequencies provided the frequencies are in the upper half plane, provided the imaginary part is positive because that provides a damping factor. Okay. So, this says this function here if it exists for real omega will certainly exist for complex omega in the upper half plane hmm? and will be an analytic function of omega. So, you can write dispersion relations for it in real and imaginary parts are related by Hilbert transforms. Okay. In particular there are no singularities in the upper half plane. So, this function is analytic. imaginary omega greater than equal to 0 as a function of the complex frequency omega it is analytic. Okay. Then this symmetry property that I wrote down will be shifted to chi of minus omega equal to chi star minus omega star equal to chi star of omega that is easily verified. If omega is in the upper half plane, omega star is in the lower half plane and you put a minus sign it goes back to the upper half plane. So, there is a reflection property in the upper half plane and does not refer to what it does in the lower half plane at all because we have no information on it as it stands. Okay. Now, you know that if you have an analytic function of a complex variable, it cannot be analytic everywhere. If it is then it is a constant including at infinity then it is a constant. So, this thing here must definitely have singularities in the lower half plane one or more singularities in general. Lower half plane because of the Fourier transform convention I have chosen. I chose plus signs etcetera etcetera I stuck to that convention then it is analytic in this. Half plane. So, the point is a causal linear retarded response will lead to a susceptibility which is analytic in one of the half planes either upper or lower half plane. Okay. The example we looked at mu of omega this fellow here was 1 over m gamma minus i omega it has a pole at omega equal to uh, 
माइनस आई गया सो इट्स इन द लोअर हाफ प्लेन वॉट हैपन्स इफ यू हैड स्लाइटली मोर जनरल सिस्टम देन दिस एल आर सर्किट लेट्स पुट एन एल सी आर सर्किट एंड सी वॉट हैपन्स वॉट्स द एडमिटन्स फॉर एन एल सी आर सीरीज सर्किट What's the admittance? Well, the equation of motion is L times the charge, which is Q double dot plus R times Q dot plus Q over C equal to the voltage, applied voltage or whatever, V of T, applied voltage, right? So, if I take the Fourier transform on both sides, then they are related to each other by the complex admittance. So, what is y of omega in this problem? Equal to 1 over q double dot. So, that produces minus i omega whole squared. So, it is minus l omega squared and this produces a minus i omega r plus 1 over c. right so let's take the minus sign here and write it as uh, l omega squared plus this guy minus this guy let's divide by l so 1 over l times r over l minus 1 over lc in this fashion uh, sorry r over l and r over l is what we call gamma the ca inverse characteristic time constant so, this fellow here is equal to minus 1 over L times omega squared plus I omega gamma minus omega naught squared. That is the square of the frequency of the purely reactive circuit without any resistance. And what are the poles of this guy? at omega equal to minus i gamma over 2 plus or minus square root of minus so that is equal to omega naught squared minus gamma squared over 4. I took out the 2 and divided this. Okay. So, that is where the poles are. Now, if it is an under damped circuit then of course, this is bigger than that and then both poles are in the lower half plane. Right. So, indeed it satisfies this causality, this uh, analyticity condition and where are these poles by the way? In the omega plane to start with one of them is at minus i gamma over 2 plus that square root and the other fellow is at minus that square root, they are out here. right? So, this is the fellow that corresponds to the plus 1 corresponds here and this negative 1 corresponds to this. What happens if I now uh, change this frequency or increase the friction a little bit such that finally, it becomes critically damped. I go on increasing gamma or I decrease omega naught till it becomes over damped. What will happen to these poles? They cannot go up, they cannot go up because it has got to be analytic in the upper half plane, right? When will they coincide? Well, they will coincide when uh, they become both these poles will start moving in this fashion and they coincide at one point at critical damping, right? So, this goes away and you have just one of them at minus some number here and then what happens to the poles? Well, one of them will go up like this and the other one will go down like this because now this fellow becomes pure imaginary. Right? So, one of them as you increase the parameter gamma towards infinity, one of them moves towards 0 and the other one moves out to minus infinity, but remains in the lower half plane. 
Now, this is a matter of convention. We have said that uh, our Fourier transform convention is such that the generalized susceptibilities, the cause, the um, have an, the retarded causal retarded susceptibilities have anal are analytic in the upper half plane, the frequency. Okay, and that's borne out in these simple cases. But still, this is not general enough, especially in the case of uh, even in the case of the simple Langevin model, this is not good enough because we have assumed a friction constant, but we did not say that this friction constant depends on time at all. A much more general thing would be to say that this uh, dissipation will itself be time dependent. Okay? We need to put a memory kernel, so we will do that next time. We will see quickly how the uh, fluctuation dissipation theorems will continue to hold good, but this time the second fluctuation dissipation theorem will become a non-trivial statement. We will see.